I shut that thing down and the whole ecosystem collapsed a couple months later. Then I wrote an article in TechCrunch, which was one of the most popular articles ever on TechCrunch, how to spam Facebook like a pro. And then I got death threats. Our guest today is the chief executive officer of Blitzmetrics, a digital marketing company which partners with schools to train young adults. Dennis's program centers around mentorship, helping students grow their expertise in digital marketing ad campaigns for clients like the Golden State Warriors, Nike, and Rosetta Stone. He's an internationally recognized lecturer in Facebook marketing and has spoken over 730 times in 17 countries. Dennis has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, LA Times, TechCrunch, Fox News, CNN, CBS, and co-authored Facebook Nation. He's a regular contributor to Adweek's Social Times column and is published in Social Media Examiner. Dennis has held leadership positions at Yahoo and has completed over 20 marathons, including a 70 mile ultra marathon. So please join me in welcoming Dennis Yu to the Escape Your Limits podcast. So what are you doing in San Diego? <laughs> We're hanging out at Social Media Marketing World with all of our sunny San Diego friends. So, um, so are you, what, what, what are you doing here specifically, apart from just hanging out? You're, you're working, really, aren't you? Yeah, I get to hang out with people like you and get paid for it. <laughs> and we have great partners as well. Yeah. So you've got and a session tomorrow? On Friday. Oh, on Friday. Okay. On Facebook ads, okay. lead gen, and everything else. Yeah. So tell us, you're, can, I, can I call you a bit of a, a, a geek? Is yeah, that, absolutely. Is that good? <laughs> yeah. Geek is better than nerd. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So, so tell us about how you got into this. Were you just born uh, a bit of a data geek and you know, behind computers, is that your, your beginning or did, did someone sort of force yeah. you into it? No one. My dad forced me to do calculus. I was doing that by the time I was eight. Really? And you know, the good Asian parents that want to get you to do math, I found that I was good at math. I didn't speak English until I was seven. So I found the way that I could get back at other folks was to be good at math. And I actually started out being put in, I guess it's special education for the retarded children really? back almost 40 years ago, right? And I thought, I'm gonna show you guys that I'm intelligent. I'm gonna show you that I actually can think. Just because I don't understand the words that you're saying doesn't mean that I'm dumb. And the other Americans, I remember my teacher in second grade, Mrs. Gore, she would wiggle my cheeks and say, oh, you're so fat and you're so dumb. Because I was chubby back then, I'm chubby now again. And I was thinking, I'm, I'm going to show you, right? And so I studied the unabridged Oxford English Dictionary for three or four hours every day until I learned English. And I represented California in the National Spelling Bee in 1988 in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so I learned English. And I like to say that I speak English better than most other people that consider themselves American, even though I was born in Dayton, Ohio. Oh, you was born here? Yeah. And how, and, so how come you didn't speak English? Until, was it just at home, your, your parents? We spoke Chinese and my parents didn't want me to have a broken accent. Right. So the first words that I learned in English weren't probably the words that you learned. I got sent to the principal's office a lot for saying words that I thought the kids told me, this is how you say, this is how you really love somebody. So I was very distrustful of anybody that was trying to get me to do something. Right, right. So, so math was a sure thing, okay. right? Math is like, you solve the equation, the answer is five, everyone understands the answer is five and you get full credit. And did you, when, when you was young then, was what, where were, without knowing too much about your age, what was going on in the world of sort of computer and technology? What, how, what, what was the world like when you was at school then? There weren't computers quite yet. Okay. Although my parents, because they worked in aerospace and my mom worked in Honeywell, we got access to some of the very first computers. And these are the ugly, you know, CRT, amber screen, you know, floppy diskette kind of programs. And I was learning the program. I did things in basic and COBOL, and I wrote programs that would do graphics. And I started to make money doing word processing. So I think it was 35, 36 years ago, I was doing things like going to law firms and writing up their legal documents, going from the transcriptions and actually typing the, th the things up, like typing up invoices, categorizing. There was one law firm for the summer I calculated how much they had to pay out in, in death and dismemberment. Like if for workers comp, like if you lose a pinky, that's worth $100. Or if you lose a thumb, that's worth $500. Use your whole arm, that's like $3,000. And I did that in spreadsheets using things like Lotus 1, 2, 3 before that, yeah. there was Windows, right? Before <laughs> there was Excel, before there was really Microsoft. And that just taught me that it was better. Now, min wage in California back then was $4.65 an hour. 
and I found that I could work for law firms making $15 or $20 an hour. And you could, like as a 10 or 11 year old kid, imagine what, what that's like where you're making what seems like a lot of money, yeah. right? Because I was doing things like gardening for, for $4.65 an hour. And that taught me, hey, if I could learn these tools that these other people that were old, like I'm old now, didn't know how to do, I could make so much money. I could program VCRs, I could take electronics apart. And I found that every year there are these new sets of tools that 95% of people just get confused by. Mm. You know, it could be how do you configure your pixels inside Google Tag Manager? Or how do you run Facebook ads? There's complexity that appears to be very difficult, but when you actually jump in, you find it's actually not that hard. Like Mark Cuban, I remember meeting him, this was 20 years ago, before he became famous, before he owned the Mavs and all that. He was selling computer parts in Dallas. And I went to school in Dallas too at SMU uh, just over 20 years ago. And he said that he would read the manuals and learn how these computers worked. And he'd go door to door for CompUSA and, and whatever, selling to different businesses, computers, not because he was an expert, but because he merely took the time to read and to even know anything, to even do a little bit of work was enough to, do, to know more than anyone else that would buy. And I find that's the case today, even though there's so much information out there, people still don't know anything. No, and, and did, you must have had some kind of gift though, that because I, I certainly, maybe I'm not intelligent, but I certainly wasn't. I, I remember Lotus, but I, I didn't have that kind of brain. So do you think that was something that you were gifted with and then you, you sort of took it to another stage or? A lot of people use that as a cop out. They yeah, say, right. oh, you've been, you know, it's because you're intelligent and therefore, you know, it's, I can never do that. And I say, you know, it's amazing how intelligent you get the harder you work, right? It's amazing how, how lucky you are the harder you work. And one of my professors, Dr. Susan Dodgers, who taught economics, I went to SMU for undergrad and then London School of Economics, she said, it was a joke, but she said, man, I don't know how these, these professors, they seem to know whether I studied or not because when I study, they make the test easy. So it wasn't even worth studying. And then if I don't study, they made the test hard. It's like they knew I didn't study. So they made the test really hard, right? Was there, were there things that you were kind of doing back then that are still relative to today in terms of kind of, you know, understanding something quickly and being able to take that information and, and you know, use that in, in a way that other people can uh, apply or simplify yeah. it, do you think? Was that? So just imagine, Matthew, you're eight years old, you're like me, and you're buying snacks and lunch at the school cafeteria. And the school cafeteria has only a couple options. You can buy a Snickers bar for 75 cents, or you can buy a Twix for 75 cents, or you can buy an actual lunch for $1.50, right? And, you, and you're eight years old like me, and you want to make money, and you're wondering, well, I know I can go to the store and get Snickers for 25 cents, and they're selling them for 75 cents. I know that I could actually get them in bulk, like 10 of them, for a dollar. And in fact, I would go to the store, I would walk down the hill to Long's Drugs, and I would buy Twix and Snickers and Kit Kat and M&Ms, and I would start to sell them somewhere between what I paid, which is 10 cents, and 75 cents what these kids were paying. And I guess that's called price arbitrage. Another thing is that students would get money from their parents. They get a, a dollar fifty, which is just enough to buy lunch. But these kids would take that dollar fifty, and instead of buying lunch, they would buy two candy bars, or they would buy an ice cream and a Coca-Cola. So the school would institute a system where you could buy these little tickets, and the tickets would cost like a dollar twenty-five or something like that. And these kids would give me their lunch tickets, these lunch vouchers, these pieces of paper, and I'd give them a dollar and off of the dollar, then they could go buy the candy and whatever it was. And I discovered this kind of price arbitrage. I did the same thing when I went to a boarding school, Chote Rosemary Hall in Connecticut, where it's mostly for super rich kids, right. like the sons of you know, um, princes of, you know, like these rich oil princes. And they would get their allowance, you know, sometimes $50,000 every month, and they would spend their money, and they wouldn't have enough money in the last half of the month until they got replenished. So then they'd be able to borrow from me and I would literally take my bicycle and I would go all the way down the hill to stop and shop and I would fill up on groceries, put them in, in my wagon in the back, which I had in my, and, I, and I'd stock my dorm full of food. And I started to do a credit system because I knew how to calculate simple things in a spreadsheet on who owed me exactly how much money. And I charge them interest and let them run a tab. I did the same thing when I worked at Pizza Hut when I was in college. I was 
sometimes I would drive, sometimes I would make the pizza, sometimes I would take the order up front. And when I was driving, it, it drove me nuts how some people would tip really well and other people wouldn't. I'd, I'd try to guess, like, who would, how can I predict who's going to give me a good tip, right? Is it the rich people? Like, who do you think gives, gives the best tips? Probably not the rich people, I would guess. <laughs> it's not the rich people and it's not the poor people. It's the poor, people in the middle. Mm. And so I started to map these people with pins to figure out who is most likely to give tips. And I even, in, in the, because you, you, you'd call in the pizza, oh, welcome to Pizza Hut, can I have your phone number? And then that was your primary key that, that would pull up your record. And in the comments section where people would typically say, oh, be, they have a gate, beware the dog, I would say um, the, they tipped only $1.25 or they didn't tip at all and, and keep a record of all their different tips. And all the other drivers started to use that system that I used, which was basically hacking the comments field. And then the manager found out and realized, that, you know, hey, you can't be doing stuff like that, right? <laughs> Interesting. So you are, you, you've got a, a natural entrepreneurial brain for making money, and then you've got this sort of, I, I suppose, way of looking at numbers and information. How, how did you then take that into, how did you start in marketing then? What, what was that journey all, all about? And what did it look like when you got involved uh, in those early days? So in the early, early days for me, when I was a child, I was selling candy. And the idea of arbitrage is, I'd buy it for 10 cents and I'd sell it for 33 cents or 50 cents. And when the internet started to open up, back in about 95, 97, it was the same kind of thing. You had traffic arbitrage because traffic that you'd buy for $10 from a newspaper or magazine, you could buy for 10 cents on the internet to be able to reach people. I when, remember when, when you say that on a, on a magazine then, so what was that, like people advertising and you paying yeah, for Yeah, so in a magazine right? you're, you're typically paying for reach. So if you want to run an ad in the LA Times in the travel section on Sunday, then it's going to have a reach of $450,000. The price is, you know, $10,000 so you can calculate, you know, $4 per thousand people or whatever it might be. Yeah. And I remember advertising on AOL, which was the first place that you could buy banner ads or through double click, and I get that traffic for a penny or even less per thousand, right? And I had a friend who owned a karate studio and it was just in Dallas, just one karate studio in Dallas, not a chain. And I bid on the keyword karate and I owned it nationwide because there was no geotargeting. It was so effective driving more students to his martial arts school. Even though I was targeting the entire United States, the traffic was so cheap, it was still worth doing just to the people in Dallas. <laughs> and That's how cheap the traffic that was. How long ago was it? That was 97. Right, okay. So, so it started with AOL were the first people doing that type of advertising. Yeah, because right? it was AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy. There were no search engines. AltaVista and some of the other guys were just right, starting to yeah. get going. All, you know, Yahoo just started. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you went on to work for Yahoo in, with our ads product, did you? And what was that? You know, what, was, what was going on there? Had they, had, yeah. had, what, were they just developing it at that point? particular time or, or was it already in place when you joined? Yahoo back then was just a few engineers and it was a home page that was curated by David Philo. So, so David and Jerry are the two co-founders of Yahoo and what they would do is actually have, just like you have here, a list of websites that they would manually hard code onto the most popular page on the internet. So it's just a file structure and you could click on Yahoo Sports and then go to the NBA and then go to the Golden State Warriors and then look at a particular player and look at their sports. So it was a big file tree. There was no search engine back then. Right. And they had built different properties. So you can imagine Yahoo is the homepage. Then you have mail and sports and finance and Yahoo personals. And my job was to bring all that data together. And the funny thing is that you would think, oh, this is Yahoo. They have everything together. It's a big corporation. But re what it really was, was like one of those dot paintings, right? Where every one of these dots is separate and each of these systems was separate. So I had to go to the engineers at each of these properties and say, okay, how do I connect your database back to the central reporting system so I could create reports that would say, this is how much traffic we have. This is how many sales we have across all the people that have bought a domain from small business or all the people that have signed up for a Yahoo Personals dating subscription. Or these are how many users have signed up for Yahoo Mail or have signed up because they've done a Yahoo search and then realized they want to then check their mail. And to be able to put all that data together, I was actually a social engineer because all of these systems were built on different frameworks. 
different platforms, different databases, named differently. There, there was no standardization, but according to the user, the user's like, oh, Yahoo, and then they're clicking around. They don't realize every one of those systems is completely separate. Right. Did, did you know at the time what you were about to create? Because I guess it hadn't really been you know, a I was naive. I thought it would be easy. I thought, oh, I'm going to come in. They're going to have all the documentation. I can start to build a metadata layer. We can start to do some really cool optimization and personalization. And it wasn't until maybe three years later that I was able to do that. And when I first came in, I thought, my goodness, this is like a rat's nest. And the other thing I thought during my first couple of days there is that I'm going to get fired from this place because A, I'm not getting the work done. And B, I'm sitting every day next to these people who built the foundation of the internet. Like two cubes away from me was Rasmus Leerdorf, who invented PHP, right? Mm -hmm. They're the other people who've invented the core technologies, core contributors to the Linux kernel, for example, right? I'm sitting next to them and I'm thinking, they're going to expose me as a fraud, right? They're gonna realize that Dennis doesn't know anything and say, who hired this guy, <laughs> right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm at the urinal and I'm peeing next to David Philo, right? <laughs> or one of these other, and he uses, he uses F word, or like foul language is, the, is, is the, his variable names, like things like that, if you look at the code. And I'm thinking, or, you know, he's asking, oh, how was your weekend? Or I'm thinking, I don't want to talk to this guy. He's going to realize I don't know anything. Right. right. So I would spend the evenings trying to learn as much as I could. And it wasn't until maybe a few months later that people would start to approach me saying, hey, Dennis, I got a question about, I'm building a database. How do you think I should organize it? Should I organize it this way or that way? Or how do you think I should do this kind of query to optimize for performance? And I'm, every time people ask a question like that, I would say, well, obviously you do it this way. You denormalize you know, this way so you have fewer joins and run the query faster, right? And then I gradually realized, oh, I actually do know something. And these other people that I was afraid of, because I saw them as like this, they're actually just normal people. And while they might be super deep in one area, they don't really know much about other sorts of areas. And right. so I'm reasonably deep in things like databases and working with large data sets, but other people don't necessarily know about that, right? Even though they're really deep in other areas of engineering or marketing. And that's when I started to realize there's so much, not, like the more you learn, the more you realize that you don't know, and the more you need to lean on other people that have expertise in those other areas. Yeah. Was there a vision of what? that what Yahoo was going to become? Did they ever imagine it was going to be like, you know, what Google is today? Was that? I don't think anybody had that idea. We really? were just trying to keep up. There's so many different systems, so much string and duct tape. We were just trying to keep systems from breaking and scaling. The number of users that we had was just insane. But we did have the idea that we wanted to organize the world's knowledge. That was, that was the original plan. Yeah. So how would you do that? Well, first you start out by creating crawlers that are going out there and pulling all the information you can on all the web pages that you can possibly crawl and then index and then rank. But then if you really want to organize all the world's information, there are things inside the bald head of yours and my almost bald head that we want to be able to get into the database. How do we do that? Well, we need to make it easier for people to blog. We need to be able to pull information out of people's mail as in metadata, not like the words that they're saying to their grandmother, but how many messages you and I send each other and use that as signal strength to determine who your real friends are. Maybe there are 800 people that you talk to digitally every year, but can we figure out who your best friends are, the best five or 10 friends? Yes, we can. Can we use that in our partnership with Southwestern Bell or Verizon or Comcast or these other guys? Yes, we can. What if we offer free email to the people that sign up for cable with Comcast, like a package with your email and your phone and your internet and your website. and all. What if we did all that and provided amazing recommendations? What if we built our own social network on top of that based on those recommendations? What if we served ads across the entire network based on those recommendations? And those were the systems that we were building. Right. Before so, there was a Facebook, be 10 years before there was a Facebook. How soon did that come on board then? Was that right from the beginning to say that we need to be using this for some kind of advertising? People on the internet that are under 40 have always believed that everything should be free. So if they're not paying a monthly subscription, it has to be supported by ads. You're either the customer or you're the product being sold. So the more activity, the more content and data people are producing, the greater we're able to target advertising, not just to them, but to all the people that they interact with. Because on Yahoo, which is an enclosed network, just like Facebook is right now, 
what you do can help us inform how we show ads to you, but because of your relationships, even if we don't, even if you have low value, your other friends that have high value, we can increase the value of that inventory and of their interactions. I think people didn't realize that, and that's what got Facebook in trouble 10 years ago. Right, and, and just, just explain that to me again then. So, so what, what does that mean? Do you remember when Facebook launched apps? It was called F8 back in May 2007, and there were games like zombies and werewolves and ninjas and food fighting and Farmville. Do you remember those right, games? Yeah. So those games were built by third parties on top of Facebook's platform, okay. which allowed, say, say me as an app developer, to be able to create an app that you would come in and you would say, yes, you know, I agree. And it would then not only give us, or give the app developer that information about that user, but all of the friends of that user, all right? Because right? that's what made the game frictionless. Because then when you came in, you wanted to challenge Dan or Kevin to a duel or to throw tomatoes at each other or whatever it was inside these social games which required that the game had to have access to who your friends were. Otherwise right. it would just be a, it would be, you wouldn't have to like type in everyone's, do you remember 20 years ago with the phone you'd have to type in in the address book everyone's phone number, just a real pain in the butt. Imagine it was all right there, frictionless. That's what we did. But because these app developers were able to get the information on their users and the friends of those users, the average user having 400 friends, the amount of data targeting that's possible was incredible. Right. So we, had, we built a, a system that provided analytics for all those app developers. And between the users that they had and the friends of those users, we had over 200 million users in our database. Over 100 times what Cambridge Analytica ever had. Wow. Right? And that was at Yahoo, was it? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that was after. That, oh, that was, okay. That's after I left Yahoo. Right, okay. Yeah. But I was, I've always been used to and impressed by large data systems. Yeah. You know, Yahoo... I would argue we had the largest store of internet data outside of maybe like the federal government. Right? Really? And the kind of data mining that we could do was incredible. Because we had all the search logs, <clears throat> that's incredible. We had all your mail, we had all of your activity across these other properties. We never got in an issue, like a situation that Facebook's in now, for example. Why do never you think happened that to was then? Just because it was too early for people to really know what you were doing, you think? Or? <laughs> no, I, I think we just never took things to that level. We, right. didn't, we didn't push things. I'll give you an example. So when you're on the Yahoo network, you can do things like browse sports. or We had the number one sports and number one news properties, for example, right? You wanted to check the score of the game, right? March Madness. But then you wanted to check your mail. Then you had to log in. So 80% of our traffic was when people were not logged in. And so that was called the browser cookie. And then when you're logged in, that's the L cookie, the login cookie. So you had the B cookie and the L cookie. And we found, my team found, that we could tie those cookies together. And so the 20% of the time where you're logged in, we can associate that with all the other time that you're not logged in and personalize over here. So we can make this inventory all of a sudden worth as much as the logged in inventory. Because when you're logged in, we know all this other information we can associate across all the sessions you've ever had. And I talked to Michael Callahan, who is the chief legal officer at Yahoo, and I said, hey, I've got this amazing technique that will make us several billion dollars more in advertising. And he said, no. I said, but it's absolutely legal. You're the chief legal officer. Of course we can do this. See, then here's the technology on how we would do that and serve ads to people and, and persist information about who they are. And he said, because these users are not logged in, they're giving us, they're indirectly telling us they do not want to be tracked. Right, yeah. Right? They didn't explicitly say don't track us. Right. And Facebook has gone the other way. They're ask for forgiveness instead of ask for permission. So at Yahoo, we said, unless users were explicitly giving us permission to be able to target, we didn't want to do that. Do you remember when Gmail came out? Yeah. And Gmail started showing ads, and people got mad saying, hey, G uh, Google's reading our mail and serving ads based on the content. Of, and of course, it's machines that are doing that, but it, it's almost like a person's yeah. like you know, peeping Tom is reading your mail. <laughs> And they started to make money off of those ads, and that's how they were able to say 50 megs of free storage or 100 megs of free storage because it was advertising subsidized. Right. But us at Yahoo, we had this thing called Yahoo Briefcase, so you have to pay for storage for your mail. You have okay. to pay an extra $5 or $100 or whatever for a larger mailbox. And so we didn't want to change that over, even though Google was, was making money by monetizing their mail with ads. We wanted to charge users for the storage and have no ads at all. And guess who won that game? Google. <laughs> so are you, are you saying then, so the thing that you realized then back at Yahoo in terms of you know, crossing over the logged in and the not logged in, that was then adopted by people like Google and mm -hmm. Facebook later on, which is why they 
And there's more data. And I think it wasn't until the mobile revolution with all the data that's coming on here, you know, data is the new oil, you hear people say, yeah. right? And plus millennials that don't want to pay for anything, they have less privacy guards in place. They're okay. willing to share. They're willing to go live. They don't mind that the camera is tracking what's going on, right? right. And maybe people like you and I think the camera is only on in certain times as opposed to millennials that think the camera is always on. So the fact that there's more data and the fact that they don't want to pay is a natural perfect storm to create the situation that we're in now. Right. So in terms of, I'm going to sort of build this up. So in terms of what people, whether it's a Google or a Facebook, knows about you, are you, are you saying then that pretty much most of, if, if you're on a system like Google, your email and your, what you post on social media and a lot of what goes on, <laughs> on your phone, that's kind of up for grabs. You know, most you know, these companies know all about that and they're, they're using this information to then you know, sign oh, yeah. you up. Your GPS that you walked over here from the convention center right. to the Hyatt, they know that. Whether or not you're actually using those apps right now. If the phone's in your pocket and it's on, they know what you're doing. Really? They're tracking that. Even if you turn your phone into airplane mode, the GPS is still tracking it. Really? Yeah. And okay. sometimes you might be at a restaurant and someone mentions some particular brand you've never heard of and then you see an ad for that. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's weird things that have happened and I'm like, how the hell does that you know, how, how, well, that's a weird coincidence. So what you're saying is that it's listening and watching. Well, Facebook and Google both say they don't use that data for targeting. Right. Okay. That's what they say. Right. And, but you don't, no one really knows, I guess, whether that's. Well, okay. at Yahoo, we were doing a lot of tracking. Right. Wow. So what's, what's your advice about this thing? Like, can you, can you ever turn it off or is it? <laughs> is it you know, even, it even if your phone's <laughs> off, Uncle Sam can still turn it on and still listen to you. So it's either you're on, you know, Walden Pond with Thoreau and you have your tinfoil hat, you're a Luddite, or you just accept the age of tracking and data is already upon us. It's been right. with us for the last 10 plus years. Every single phone call that's ever occurred in the United States for the last 20 years has been recorded onto a hard drive. Right. It's not enemy to state that will happen into the future. It's already been happening. It's just a question of what do you need to do to protect yourself how is AI going to eventually solve some of these issues and create new ones of their own, right? You'll have a lot of false positives where, because you know, people will make jokes saying, oh, you know, let's, what if we just use the words, you know, kill Donald Trump, assassinate president. Well, let's just keep saying these words and then maybe the feds will show up at the door. That'll never happen because they do it by association based on metadata, based on who your friends are. Right. So actually these, the AI is getting smarter and smarter and determining who is actually just fooling around versus who actually has the intent to do something nefarious. Right. And this is the same kind of AI that's used to make recommendations on what the next thing you need to see on Netflix is, or on Amazon, what other products you might like. And they're, they're pretty good at it, right? <laughs> or what shows up in the newsfeed. It's, it's the same algorithm that does that. Right. So it's using a lot of different information about you, what you do, to kind of predict what's likely, what you're likely to do next, I suppose. Yeah. Wow. That's impressive. Do you believe that the future is going to be bleak? That it's going to be a brave new world or 1984? Or do you believe that technology is a positive thing where you have self-driving cars and everything becomes cheaper and you know, the, uh, computers are serving us? It depends on whether you yeah. have this, this optimistic or pessimistic, you know, in the movies, the robots take over and then you know, kill everybody. But I think that's what happens in the movies. I think there is a huge plus with technology and when things are confusing to people, they naturally have fear. Yeah. And I believe you can't have fear when you understand something. That's mm -hmm. why I have no fear of digital marketing. Yeah. So, so let's, talk, let's relate this to marketing then. So I think what we've said is that there's a ton of powerful stuff on, on your phone in terms of data that people have on you that, that can either be used in good or bad ways. And, and so, you know, if we look at business, let's assume that it is positive. What, let, I, I guess, pre-Facebook, what, you know, if you had to simplify marketing and digital marketing in terms of, you know, Google and, and mm -hmm. Yahoo, what did it look like then? And, and then I'll sort of, you know, we'll talk about what does it look like today. So if, just, to, just to give some people context, what was marketing like and what were some of the things that people used to be able to do in the advent of, you know, Google and, and that type of stuff? 20 years ago, you had two distinct crowds. You had direct marketing, like you saw with 
direct mail. Right? Ed McMahon's going to give you a million dollar check. They're trying to sell things to you. Direct response copy, buy my stuff, infomercials, right? all about buy right now. And then you have branding where, you know, where's the beef, takes the licking and keeps on ticking, uh, cool slogans like TV commercials, CPG stuff, and you had nothing in the middle. You had no engagement. And the reason why you didn't was because the channels weren't wide enough to allow for personalization. You had only blunt force instruments like TV, radio, magazine, so you could only deliver a singular message. Therefore, the singular message was, here's a cool you know, Coca-Cola, make everybody smile, or you know, Disneyland, happiest place on earth, all the way down to buy our stuff. Right. And is, but, is that because, so, so are you saying then that the channels were so broad that a lot of the marketing and advertising was just very broad and they had to sort of hope that they would yeah, cast a big net? Yeah. So the channel through digital allowed, and back then we called it internet marketing, we called it web mastering. The channel allowed us to have feedback in two directions. Because it used to be mass media was a one-way delivery. Right. But the fact that we could get an email back from somebody, or they could engage on an app and that gave us activity, or we could read their mail and based on what they're saying, or based on whether they clicked on something, or they watched a video or installed an app, that gave us feedback. And that okay. feedback would then allow us to be able to respond back in a certain way. So we could respond back with retargeting. We could reply back to them. We could give them a phone call. And that allows what I guess about 20 years ago is called closed loop marketing or okay. life cycle marketing. Right. ABC activity based costing. Okay. And so what, yeah, and I'm just going to sort of talk this back. So what, what happens, and I'm talking to people probably with base knowledge, but they would, uh, previously it would just go out. Then with the internet, you would send it, send something out. People would respond to that either positively or negatively, and then you could, with things like retargeting, you could serve them up something else yeah. that was that would either take them further down the sales process yeah. or kind of say, oh, oh, you know, show them a different message because probably that one didn't work. Is that yeah. more or less what happened? So to the person who is not a full-time digital marketing engineer kind of person, before we had really cold and really hot, okay. right? We had brand marketing to cold audiences and then it's like bye, bye, bye. And if you're an engineer, you'd say, you know, if, if we had two buckets of water, one ice cold and one boiling, and I took your hands and stuck them together like this, you would say, oh, on average, I feel warm, right? Meanwhile, this hand's frozen and this one's, you know, scalding, right? <laughs> and so that wasn't a very efficient way of doing marketing. And that's not an efficient way of building relationships either. Right. So if you think about relationship building where there's, learning her name and going on first date and going steady and you know proposing and getting married like those stages of a relationship take people from cold all the way to warm now that's possible because of the data and the systems and the tools and all that but the mentality of gym owners and small business owners and really almost anyone in marketing hasn't caught up to that yeah and here's where it's funny here's where it goes full circle people harken back to the old days where you would go into the small town to the shopkeeper and the shopkeeper would say, hey, Matthew, how are you doing? Do you want to have in whatever your favorite you know, order is, would you like to have you know, this particular type of coffee? Because they remembered who you were. Yeah. They remembered something about your family. And that's what people yearn for. That's why we were talking about, I was staying at the Four Seasons in Puerto Vallarta, right? And they remember your name and you, know, you like mints on the pillow, just all these kinds of things. But the funny thing is that we've gone from that personalized small village <clears throat> to the big city, anonymous, faceless, now back to personalization again. Right. People want to move to personalization, but we can never move back to where we were. Now what we need to do is move from this mass media to mass personalization. And what that means for us as business owners is, how do we simulate the old days of one-to-one -one relationships and building rapport? and understanding people's preferences and having conversations and having long, slow dinners together. How do we simulate that in this current age knowing that we can't go back? And the way to do it is we create one minute videos. We create personal brands, right? You create your personal brand. You're interviewing other people. What does that have to do with selling fitness equipment? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> but if you look at sales, last couple of weeks we spent time with mortgage brokers, with professional sports teams, with insurance agents, with e-commerce, like all these different industries. And what they have all in common is that everyone that's building sales does it through personal selling. Because people buy because of the trust. They, the, the whole key to be really good, being really good at sales is building trust, right? right? You know good salespeople, they can move between different industries. 
they, they could sell you know, gym memberships and they can sell real estate. It doesn't really matter what they're selling because they're still in the business of building trust. If you're good at building trust, you can sell anything. Right. Yeah. And so the key to, to succeed now is not better technology because that's already done by the networks and the players. The key right. for us as business owners mm -hmm. is we build trust at scale by having interviews with other people, by sharing our expertise, by telling our stories, by sharing what we believe in. And that's what causes people to buy, which is very illogical. But if you look at any situation where you're making a decision, in economics, we have something called rational ignorance. Rational, like what's something you've bought on Amazon recently? Um, or I just in general? I'm, I'm an, what, what's something I've, what is something? <laughs> something that you've bought, right? That's not a difficult question. A shirt, yeah. Okay. Now, if you look at the reviews on a shirt, you could literally spend days reading all the reviews, yeah. asking all your friends, going online, looking. But instead, you have some kind of heuristic that you use. And rational ignorance is saying, you know what? I'm going to take the thing that has the best reviews and I'm just going to buy that one. I'm going to ignore 99% of the available information. The amount of information available, just going into the supermarket, you want to buy strawberry jam, there's 138 kinds of strawberry yeah. jam. How do you decide? You could spend there for days. You just sit there. Meanwhile, you know, it's hours have gone by sitting in the aisle on your phone. But you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So if the amount of information has increased beyond your, increasingly beyond your ability to make that decision, you need to employ rational ignorance, which is intentionally ignoring other information or using yeah. a heuristic or a filter saying, of all this information, I'm going to choose just this one piece and I'm, I'm going to make a decision based on that. And mm -hmm. that piece that people decide is almost always going to be based on relationship. And I, and I, yeah, and I, and I guess one of the things, like, so I, I, when I travel a lot, if I look at restaurants yeah. and coffee shops and whatever, you know, you, it's like coffee near me, you know. Juice and how do you decide? Me. Yeah, and it, <laughs> sometimes you sit there for just ages going through stuff yeah. and review, and it is difficult, I guess, because there's a lack, if, if there was a brand, I suppose for me, if, if there's a Whole Foods in the town, you kind of know yeah. what you're going to get and what they have, and, and, and so I'll, you know, put that in straight away, because that's a brand I trust, not necessarily because it's as good as, you know, maybe a little shop that does some nice salads or something, but it's just the only one I can think of. So, What's the like, number one hamburger in the world? I guess McDonald's. It is, but is it the best hamburger? Uh, no. But it's number <laughs> one because not. there's consistency and you're familiar with it. Right. And so it goes back to the same principles on if you build your brand, if people are driving down the freeway and they pull off because they need to get yeah. gas and there's two random restaurants and then there's McDonald's, most people are going to choose McDonald's, yeah. right? Because it's, they're going to choose what's, even if McDonald's is terrible, even if they know it's terrible, they're going to choose what's familiar, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So in, in any, no matter what we're selling, if the, the customer, potential customer, has seen us before, they do a Google search for a yeah. plumber and they've seen us before, and there's four or five other plumbers that could be better than us, they're going to choose us just because they've seen us before. So what about if they know, um, you know, a few of them. So if you have got, so let's, let's talk about the fitness market. So what happens if there is three or four gyms and you know them all? How do you then employ that? Because I, I guess you know all of them. Mm -hmm. You kind of know what they're like. How, how does that apply to where you've got quite a bit of competition? So then who has the strongest trust signal? You're going to go based on your friend's recommendations. Okay. So you have some friends that go to this gym versus this gym versus that, and you might ask them. You might ask them on social media. You might ask them at Starbucks, right. and that's how people make decisions. They're always trying to narrow down to a trust filter. If okay. we can discover what that trust filter is, our marketing becomes very effective. Okay, okay. So I'm just going to take a step back. So what we're saying then is, is in the sort of pre-Facebook days, we have, let's, let's use Google, Yahoo, and you could, you could put some ads on there and people would go in there and they'd look for gyms or food or whatever and then they would get an advert and people would know them and, 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 they, and then Google could sort of follow you around with those ads depending on what you look like. Yeah. So what, what we're saying is, even though I guess still a lot of people are doing that, I suppose, um, what you're saying is that's probably not the best way. If you're gonna spend some money, that's not one of the most effective. Is that, is that what we're kind of saying? There's a better way to do it now than I'm yeah. spending money on Google. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so now if you're a business, we're in the age of, I guess, social media. Is that, mm -hmm. is that what you would call where we are, I guess, today? Is that, is well, social that? media is such a broad term. It means almost anything. I okay. think we're in the age of personalized selling through okay. trust. Okay. And people make decisions based on trust. We're all in the business of trust. Okay. And, and what are the main, I, I guess, are the main platforms to do that? Your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your... Instagram or are there other 
things that you can do that with? You know, how, where do you where do you start looking if you want to do that trust marketing? I think that from a platform standpoint, I see email, web, and social as the primary three. That that's a tripod. Okay. I don't believe in chasing every single channel that's out there. Oh, now you need to have a Quora and a LinkedIn and an Instagram and a Twitter and a Facebook, and then pretty soon you're just you know, machine gun marketing. Yeah, because it's a lot if you're a small business, particularly. Yeah. And then you, you get stuck in different tools, right? You know, Keep is one of our favorite tools. But you could then get so myopically focused on the technical details that you miss the relationship. So instead of thinking about the platforms, I like to think about these three components of authority. People, place, and proof. So people, who's saying it? So if I right. tell you, hey, I'm really good at Facebook ads and you don't know who I am, whatever. Yeah. But you see Mark Zuckerberg hang out with me, that has some proof, you know, that, that has authority because of who it is. Place. So okay. we're here in San Diego, and let's say you and I are speaking at Social Media Marketing World, that has authority with other social media marketers, right? Versus a bum on the street, right? And then proof is here are the 15 steps that we've used to drive sales for the Golden State Warriors or to build remarketing campaigns for you. Or here's our process on exactly how we promote the Strongbox and Octagon you know, in, in this particular way. This is a recipe on how we launch a campaign. That's proof. Any of these three are elements of building trust and authority. And when people can see one or more of these, or ideally you know, 10 points, 10 points, 10 points, we have 30 points, then people will say, wow, that's amazing. Because it's people who they trust who are well known. It is set in a place like in a magazine or you know me on CNN or where it's, it's in a place that has authority and then what they're saying actually carries a lot of weight and that's how people make decisions. Okay and are you saying then so putting the platforms aside because uh, I guess I, I, even last week I had Facebook have made another change so I guess these platforms can always come and go and building your business on one could be a bit risky. The people play some proof how do you you know, what, what is the business owner focused on? Is that creating video material with that information in? What's, what's the sort of, what, what, what's the, the thing that's sort of static through all of this that people should be looking at? They do what's what you're constant? doing. You made a video with Kevin in China showing how you do the manufacturing of dumbbells. The whole process, pouring the plastic, the particular formula that you have, building your own factory so you have quality control, everything to do with the supply chain. That is educational. Right. That any so that when people want to buy a, a dumbbell or a piece of equipment from you, they understand why you made those changes, as opposed to going to some other manufacturer where it's way way cheaper, but the quality is not the same, right? Or it's inconsistent. It's that kind of education where people are understanding who you are. They're understanding the you know you interviewed Tony uh, Tony Horton for example, right? And so that's associating you with these other people. Now his fans are the people that follow him because they see that he gave you an hour of time. And that puts you in the same league. You're building trust because of all the people, right? You have an interview with Ed Milet that's happening. Now all of his audience becomes your audience. You're assembling this kind of authority, but not once are you talking about Escape Fitness and okay. the products that you have. Okay. Right? Everyone needs to understand that in their, in their locus of control, they have relationships that they can maximize. But the key is they have to collect that information and then they have to broadcast it. So when we think about Facebook and Google and LinkedIn and whatever, they're actually all governed by the same algorithm. Really? The same algorithm, which is a collaborative filter. It's actually a collaborative filter. What is or that? It's mean? a reverse tree. It, it's saying that it's like a lookalike audience. So when you are on Amazon and you know, people who buy this also buy this, what's the logic that determines that? It's a lookalike audience. It's saying other people that are like Matthew, what else are they shopping for? What else do they like? What other places are they visiting, right? And all of us are actually very similar in, in terms of the little buckets that we fit in. Okay. That same filter, that same logic is open source, and it's what Netflix uses to make movie recommendations. Mm -hmm. You like this show? You, you like Lost? You might also you like Narcos? You might also like this other show about drugs or whatever it is, right? So it's do the they know you as an individual? So like as, as a, you know, you've got a yeah. certain profile, you're a male, yeah. you live here. Yeah. So they, they... But it's not even based on that. It's okay. much deeper. So right. all the stuff about removing demographic targeting as part of Facebook ads doesn't affect anything in terms of what happens in your newsfeed and what happens to the quality of information that's being driven by the filter. Because all of these guys, think about when, when you Google something, best Italian restaurant in San Diego. Yeah. Well, the system has to quickly determine not just what's the highest rated 
restaurant in San Diego, but among your friends, like my idea of a good Italian restaurant might be different than your idea. It has right. to take that into account, okay. right? So it's going to see when you do that search of your friends, what Italian restaurants do they like and give you a slightly different result than me, right? right? Which is what we'd expect, but that's a filter. So more behavior based. A everything, yeah, to... when you're on Twitter, that's a filter. When you're on LinkedIn and you have a feed, that's a filter. When you're on Facebook and you're scrolling through the newsfeed, that's a filter. Everything that you're doing is a filter because there's always more information than you have attention for. Right. Every day there's something crazy like 170 years worth of video on YouTube that's being uploaded every single day. You couldn't watch all of them. Right. So when you go to YouTube, that's a filter. Okay. How, how is that filter determining what you should see? Yeah. So what you're saying then, there's this, there's this sort of um, program, computer program, I'll use my own words, that's open source. So everybody's got access, Facebook mm -hmm. and Google yeah. and, and YouTube, and, and they pull all that information to understand behaviors of different people, not necessarily male or female, but just things they and the people around them mm -hmm. tend to like. And then it kind of, you know, when you ask it a question, it sort of gives, you, gives that back and it's pulled yeah. it from all these different areas. Is that? Yeah, and it's not magic. <laughs> it's not some like secret <laughs> algorithm, right? <laughs> Right. Okay. And did have you totally relevant? Because whatever your friends like, you're likely to like too, right? Right. Okay. And is that is is that sort of algorithm constantly? You know, is it like a kind of a never-ending, growing, clever? You know, does it keep getting more and more intelligent as time goes on, and, and the more information it gets? I, I guess yeah, it does. It, it does. It's right. learning more about you. Right. So it's two parts. One is data. The other part's model. When you hear data model. You could have the smartest model, but unless you feed it the data, it can't continue to be smart and make recommendations. So you need to collect all the data and you need an intelligent engine on top of that. So you need both parts. Okay. And that's what Google and Facebook and these other guys have because they have a massive user base yeah. with collecting lots of data and they're able to personalize on top of it. You need both. Right. Wow. That's why Amazon wants to have free shipping. That's why okay. uh, most of the media sites are free so they can get more information, more users, so therefore they can advertise better. Right, okay. It's the same thing. Uh, so that's the whole Amazon mm -hmm. gold as well then, is it? Why they're probably why they've not made money for so long. It's they're getting that information that they can then use at some point in the future. Yeah. Wow. So, in, so potentially then in a year or two years' time, that's just going to be smarter than what it is today then? It's a network effect. It's a lock-in. Right. Because who's going to want to beat Google when they deliver the best information. You could answer any question. Information is now a commodity, isn't it? Yeah. What's the capital of you know, Kenya? <laughs> it's a commodity now. So who would want to compete against that? Who would want to build another social network even though it's, it's free, right? So you can't unseat Google, Facebook, Apple, or Amazon. And some people call that the four horsemen model. Right. Because they've dominated, it's a, it's a lock-in model where each of those networks wins because of the scale that they have. Yeah. And then they have advertising that's on top of that. I've got a little fitness studio. What, yeah. what should I be thinking about? Is it, you know, a couple of simple steps where, you know, where, how do I get my foot on the ladder? So Fred already knows what he needs to do to grow his business. He's just confused by technology or thinks that he has to buy these tools or he has some consultant that wants to charge him all this money to build a website or run these marketing campaigns or a social media person that's saying you need to do this right. to intentionally confuse people. All Fred needs to do is look at his best customers and engage with them and collect some of that on video. Just like you and I talking, where you and I could talk and I'm holding the phone and I'm saying, so maybe I'm Fred and, and you're, you're Matthew and you've been working out with me and I'll say, hey, tell me about your goals or tell me about your favorite exercise or tell me where you're from or things like this. And I'm just capturing these kinds of stories and I'm taking the stories of those customers and of the employees that work here. Right. Oh, I got Sam who's worked with me for three years and you know, he's going to school or whatever it is. I'm just collecting those stories and then I'm putting it out there in my local community. So whatever city that you're in, you're not trying to advertise to the world. Whatever city you're in, maybe it's a population of 25,000, how much money does it cost to reach the entire city? Maybe it costs $10 a day to reach, unless it's New York City or something like that. But it, it's really that simple. It's collecting those stories because when you build enough awareness, that creates something that's more powerful than a one-sided testimonial because right. people get a sense of what it's like and then it reduces the fear or the risk. Okay, so, so first thing then is, you, you, is, is to kind of 
put on camera the obvious stuff. I guess the stuff yeah. that probably you take for granted. I know that when we did the dumbbell video and you and I spoke about it, you know, it's something that I've, you know, there's nothing special. That's how you make dumbbells. But well, we don't um, know that, right? Purchases yeah. don't, to you, they, that's ordinary. Yeah, and it's, and it's pretty ugly and boring. It's a factory and they're pouring stuff and it's messy. And, and I, so I suppose for me, it's like, you just think what's special about that. But I, I, what you're saying in terms of this building trust, but I guess the gym owners probably say the same thing. Well, what's special about that? You know, we've all got a receptionist and we've all got personal trainers. But what you're saying is, look, you know, tell those stories. Who are your favorite clients? Who's your favorite front desk person? Who are your trainers? So tell yeah. those real stories, number one, and get it all on your phone. People make decisions based on relationships and not price. Okay. If you're, if you're a gym and you're selling on price, you might as well just compete against 24 Hour Fitness or these other places, right? People are willing to pay a premium with a boutique gym or a CrossFit because of that relationship, because their friends are there, because there's an experience, because there's accountability, because there's someone else that's gonna be there at 5 a.m. in the morning, right, for that workout. And that's what people need to see. And if they can see that five or six times across YouTube or Facebook or in their Google searches, then that's how they choose. Right. It doesn't make sense, but that's how people decide. It's literally creating a grid. We call it the three by three grid. Nine mm -hmm. videos, nine one minute videos. Why, how, and what? Three of each, right? Three why videos about why you started this gym, about stories that are important to you, about your why, like Simon Sinek start with why. Okay. Three how videos where you're sharing your expertise, like you know pouring the plastic, or this yeah. is how you do a curl, or this is how you get fit, or this is how, how you do whatever, you're sharing your expertise. And then the what is then you're able to sell. And most people understand the what, okay. which is come in, we'll give you a month for free, or this is why our studio is better, or it's conveniently located, or like things that you do to sell, right? So when you have three and three and three, you're able to use the networks to be able to sequence down. So remarketing the ads that follow you around, anyone that watches one of these videos, we're gonna bring them down to this next set of videos. Which is the how videos. The how videos, and the yeah. how videos, we move to the what videos. So first, they get to know who you are. Okay. They trust you, they say, oh, we, I, we have the same beliefs. Oh, you know what, we, you and I, oh, we went to the same school together. Oh, that's also my favorite restaurant. Nothing related to the gym, just who you are as a person, who your people are as a person. Just things that are important to you, no selling. Okay. Then you share expertise, no selling. People can't seem to resist selling. <laughs> and only down here do you start to sell. Right. Because when, when people get down here, you've earned the right to sell. Because if they've watched a video for 10 seconds, which is where we do our remarketing sequences, okay. then you show them the next set of videos. And the only way people are gonna come down each step of this funnel is by engaging. So by the time they're here, they want to hear from you because how else could they get here? Only by having consumed content multiple times. Right. Then there's no need to sell hard because they already know you, like you, and trust you. And and that applies, so Fred with the single gym or you know, Fred's boutique chain where they've got 100 locations across yeah. the United States, that same- it Works for everybody. Works, works for everybody. Yeah, right. we do this for major chains and we do it for mom and pops. We've tested $50,000 professionally produced videos by people that have won awards versus just Dennis holding an iPhone and the iPhone vertical video that looks like a real user that doesn't look like a commercial wins. Everything that doesn't look like a commercial. And is that, and you know what a commercial looks trust, like. Trust, but you yeah. know, it's probably more authentic if it's, if it's yeah. on your phone. Yeah. Interesting. Like Ashley Furniture Home Store is a client of ours. They have 710 stores. They're the largest furniture retailer on the planet, right? right? And they have gone about, they used to do the, you know, 4th of July blowout sale, that kind of thing. They still do on TV and print, but in digital, they're recording one minute videos of different salespeople in the store and different customers and different people that work inside Ashley. And that has driven a 20X plus ROAS, right? Their sales are increasing because people buy from people because you could get that couch anywhere, right? right. Furniture yeah. is commodity. Almost every service is commodity until you inject the relationship. And what, on, on the sales guys, what are they recording then? Just talking about what they're talking really, about who they are. Really? Yeah. They don't have to be flamboyant. They don't have to be good on TV. They just have to be able to tell stories right. about where they're from, about just being human. That's how people buy. It really is that simple. And you call that, I know we spoke before, but you call that sort of top of the funnel um, marketing. Is that, mm -hmm. is that right? So, you, so you've got your sort of at the top, you've got this why story, which is just no selling, explaining who you are, letting people see behind the curtain kind yeah. of thing, as opposed to, I guess, putting on this, I suppose it's different to what used to happen years ago, where you put on this polished professional image that- But it looks brilliant. like a commercial. Yeah. You, can, you see, you know what a commercial looks like, yeah. and all of us are scrolling past the commercial. Right. And do, do you think that's why, like, 
TV commercials then don't work as well on social media because they just, they're not as believable. Do you, do you, Does it look like something from a friend of yours? Do you trust it? <laughs> no, probably not. You know, you've, you've got to be very authentic nowadays to, mm -hmm. for people to, to want to work with you. Mm -hmm. So, so you've got, the, you've got the, the why video, which is no selling, the how video. Then you have the what, which is where you basically, I guess, you know, make a sale or make an offer at, at, at that stage. I know now with things like Facebook, that the, the natural reach is a lot less than what it was when it, you know, three or four years ago. How do you then make sure that the, the people that you want to get in front of are seeing the video? Because mm -hmm. uh, now you have to pay. You have to pay. Yeah. So, the same so way just with doing Google. it organically yeah. is no longer going to get you what you need to be. Would you say? Yeah. Fifteen years ago, I could rank on any Google term I wanted to. I do a search on mortgages and I could get on the first page with just a little bit of effort and now it's very difficult. Now there's billions of search results chasing. And the same is true with any kind of network, with any kind of medium. You know, when email first came out, we had 90% open rates. Now, you know, 3%, 5% open rates. Of course, these channels become more competitive and then you have to pay, right? What a surprise. When the product is free, then us as advertisers have to pay. And just because users have Facebook for free, a lot of advertisers say, well, I'm not going to pay, I'm not going to advertise. Well, do you want to you know, if I, if, if you gave me a dollar and I gave you back $7, would you play this game? You would, it's, but oh, I'm not going to put any money in. Okay. Well then there's no point in putting any content out there because no one's going to see it. Right. You have to pay. And some simple takeaways for, I guess, from large to small businesses, how, and I've looked at doing ads and it's, it does seem quite confusing. Um, well, that's just the way my brain works. But what, what are some of the simple things that you can do to, to, to pay and be fairly effective? Do you have to go to an agency like yourself or is there anything that you can do to get started? We have training guides, but even making it simpler than that, the nine one minute videos that you literally boost on Facebook, you upload it to YouTube at the same time, you put that best content in the email, you transcribe, for example, we have a video right now. We transcribe that into an article that goes on your blog. That's all you literally have to do. And then buy the keywords related to that particular topic just within this particular area so it's relevant. So then people are on YouTube looking at how do you do whatever it is or things related to your story or how I struggle with depression or whatever it might be. Right? You can, whatever content you have that's based on why, how, and what, you can distribute across email and search and social and whatever channel. It has nothing to do with the channels. What we're paying for is distribution. We're, it's social postage. Right. It's like UPS and FedEx. You don't think of that as advertising, do you? <laughs> no, you're, but it's the same thing. We're paying to dis distribute to that content. Right. The, the trouble is that when you say advertising, people still think that it's not just the, the delivery, but it's the content itself. Right. The content itself needs to be high quality. You just happen to be paying to deliver it, which is what advertising needs to be. That's the way to think about advertising. Right. Yeah. And so how do you, how do you, I, I guess if you use it like the postal service then, how, how do you ensure that you're posting it to the right address? Is that fairly easy to work well, out? Well, you test for a dollar a day. And if people aren't opening your mail, then you, there's something wrong with your content usually. Really? Yeah. You need okay. to remake it. Maybe okay. it's not the right topic. Maybe it's not the customers that you thought that you, that, that are your best customers. Right. And it's just a matter of testing. And there's no easy, you know, you want to get six pack abs, you're not going to get there in one day. You're going to have to test, you're going to have to put in the work, be consistent about that. Yeah. Same thing. And would you, what, what's your suggestion? And I know you've obviously got your own agency, but is, is, would you suggest people kind of have someone, take someone on in house to do the boosting and, you know, working out who to put it in front of if you're, a, you know, if you're based in, let's say, New York yeah. and you want to target some people in, let's say, Manhattan, would, do you get someone in or is it just probably better to, to have an expert to do that? Or is it dependent on your situation, would you say? I don't believe in experts. For example, maybe I'm an expert yeah, in I'll digital marketing, right? I, you know, the, you heard of the 10,000 hour rules. I have, I have 70,000 hours in digital marketing, right? But does that qualify me to help a gym owner market their gym in the Bronx? No, I don't know anything about gyms and I don't know anything about the Bronx, for example, right? It doesn't carry any sort of authority. Now, I might know something about tuning ads. I might be able to look at analytics and see what's working and what's not working. But if, it, if you want to build the trust in those nine videos in the three by three, 
you need to, whoever has the relationship with those customers has to be the one that's collecting that video. And maybe you don't know how to work an iPhone. Fine. Have someone go through our one minute video training, you know, have, you know, a, a, a daughter or a friend or whatever, hold the phone, following these guides, collecting that content. That's all you have to do. Really, it's collecting content and distributing that content. Then people like us can come in and tune it. But it's not magic. You don't need an expert to set these things up. The tools, as complex as they are, actually handle most of that for us. The thing that makes an iPhone so powerful is that it absorbs the complexity so it can be simple for us. Right? The reason Facebook is simple for us as users is because the complexity is absorbed inside. That's where the AI and machine learning and all of that logic live. The reason why Amazon and Netflix are so easy to use is because that complexity is absorbed by the network. So us as business owners that want to drive more sales, we want to let the algorithm do the work for us. That means we have to put in the right ingredients. We have to put in one minute videos that are vertically shot that are based on the why, how, and what formula. If you do that, it'll work. Right. No expert will be able to create those videos for you. So are you saying that the creative and the message, I'll call it creative, the message that, you know, not necessarily it being polished, but the content of that message is probably more important to get right than Absolutely. having it is. Okay. Have you heard, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shiitake, right? <laughs> okay. I've not heard that. <laughs> yeah. you, you can bring a pile of chicken poop in here and have the best chef in the world and it's still there's nothing poop. they can do about it. The secret behind creating good content is just being authentic and providing you've got a assuming that you've got a good business that's yeah. already providing a good yeah. service. Yeah. People say that, be authentic and be real, but what does that actually mean? Yeah. Right? Oh, you need to create good content. Oh, really? Well, what does that mean? It means telling stories in a certain way. It means talking about things that are vulnerable to you or things where you've had fear or you've had to overcome a challenge or interviewing other customers or employees or partners that you have. That's, that's what being real is. It's not yelling the F-bomb, you know, that's not being real, right? Yeah. That's just being vulgar, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, you have, I guess the baseline is you've got to start with a pretty decent business. So you've got to be yeah, that's doing true. the basics. Yeah. You, you know, you have to put good customer service, good facilities or whatever. Yeah. You know, certainly, a, I, I guess a baseline in, in, in you know, Good yeah. business practices and then yeah laying on top of that if you've got a crap business then yeah well, you're gonna struggle think of digital as an amplifier right you know whatever you stick inside the box you get 10 times more of right so you put in you know ten dollars you get back a hundred dollars but if you put in minus five dollars you get back minus 50. yeah so it 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 multiplies kind of like one of my friends said that you know beer is an amplifier right so if you're if you're sad, then it makes you even more depressed. But if you want a game or whatever, you have, then it like increases the elation, right? So I think of digital Social the same beer. way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except you don't get a, you know, do you, oh, I think it'll be you regulated. I think social will be regulated like cigarettes soon. Really? Because of that, yeah. Wow. Before meeting with Dennis, you know, we've gone around, tried lots of agencies and spent a lot of money on, on this and not had anywhere near the results that we've got from you, which in terms of the amount that you spend for us is, is very, very conservative. Yeah. Just to help people understand, does it have to be expensive? Can you get away? Let's, let's say small gym in San Diego, mm -hmm. you know, around mm -hmm. this area. Yep. What would you suggest is a nice starting budget that they should be thinking of? You know, are we talking hundreds, thousands a month? $10 a day. $10 a day. And a lot of people say that's not enough money. Well, you can do a lot of testing on $10. You can run 10 ads at the same time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And every week you can recycle because every ad you can spend $7 to test. A dollar a day for a week, $7 to test. Right. And we know that 90% of ads, 90% of campaigns, 90% of emails, 90% of blog posts, 90% of everything you try in digital will fail. Whether you're a pro you, like me, I've created thousands of ads myself, or someone who's brand new, it's just across the board 90% of your stuff is going to fail. So it's going to take you many shots on goal, right? Mm -hmm. are, you, are you good at basketball, for example? Do you think it, if there's a basketball court, we saw Daryl Eves yeah. was, was shooting hoops down there. If I gave you a challenge, if you made this half-court shot, you get a million dollars. You get one shot. Would you feel pressure? Absolutely, yeah. But 
if let's say you're not even good at basketball, if I said, you know, you've got all day, you can take as many shots as you want, you only have to make one into the basket. Even if you suck at basketball, do you think you can make one? Yeah. Right? And that's the way we think about digital marketing. And so if you're that local San Diego gym, you're taking many shots. Each shot is costing you $7. It might take you 20 shots. It might take you five shots. It might take you 30 shots. But guess what happens? Once you find a winner, because it's a testimonial, because it's a tour of the gym, because it's some funny outtake, because of the receptionist, because of something, who knows, like some lighthearted moment that you could have never predicted, you can take that piece and you can have it live forever. And that's what we call a greatest hit. Because then you can take that after you spent $7, and now you can put another $100 on it. And now you can put $5 a day forever into infinity. Why do people have to keep launching marketing campaigns? It's like Sisyphus rolling the ball up the hill, right? What a waste of time. The minute you find a winner that's working for you, provided it's not a sale or a, you know New Year's, you know lose weight holiday kind of, provided it's evergreen content. Stories are evergreen. You know, Disney, Pixar, these are all evergreen, right? Because it doesn't matter what time it is. We want to shoot for mostly evergreen, not sales, not price sorts of things, because that's not how you get right. retention. People that buy on price don't stay, right? Because then they don't have any money because then they're waiting for the deal. Like it's the wrong mentality, right? People that shop on price. People that buy because of why? Because of quality, because of relationships, because of the results that they want, because of the community they, they want. Ten you know, percent of the people that buy it will always choose the premium option. They'll always choose this sweet upgrade, like the right. sweet we're in now. They'll always choose the adding the extra shrimp to the steak. They'll always choose the whatever, it is, the, the rental car upgrade to the whatever it is, right? And so when you recognize that's the case, then evergreen content, where you're selling based on who you are, not selling based on price, right? You don't want the 24 hour, like what, what is the, the, the one, Planet Fitness or whatever, like $9 a month. You're not selling to that crowd. Right. And, and do you think then if you were then to open a facility in, let's say New York, mm -hmm. that more or less once you've worked out what that greatest hit is mm -hmm. generally that you should be able to take what you've yeah. learned here and and put it yeah. if you open other facilities and every month you might earn another greatest hit and in fact you can cheat because you could ask other gym owners in other areas what's been working for them and then make versions of those videos yourself if you see a particular ad from someone that and they've run that three or four months in a row either they're really dumb and they're not watching or paying <laughs> yeah. attention or it's working for them just by applying some of these things, they could get quite an edge on a lot of their competitors, would you say? We have young adults that have no experience that are now operating at the world-class level. And yes, they're bright, but it's because they're able to get to world-class because the bar for world-class is 12 inches high. So what, why do you think is that? Just, just because it's, it, technology's moved so much quicker than most Technology people. has made it so that if you have the right process and people that are willing to put in a marginal amount of work they can find success right to be world-class as a heart surgeon or in any other field requires 10 20 30 years if you can even get there but to be world-class in driving sales using the internet the bar is 12 inches tall really? if you have the right recipe so uh, I'll give ask you a question what's a food that you like a dish something you like to eat it's almost dinner time what, what would you eat tonight uh, tuna a nice tuna with some Spinach, sauteed okay. spinach. Okay, <laughs> so let's say that on this table right now we had sushi grade ahi tuna, right? And some spinach and some olive oil and sea salt and garlic and pepper and all the different things that we, we would need to cook this meal. And here you have a recipe and it says, you know, heat up the frying pan with olive oil and put in the shallots and whatever it is, right? If you follow that recipe, do you think that you could produce the meal? Let's say that this is, this is the exact recipe that a world-class chef uses to deliver that meal in that amazing restaurant, right? You have the same ingredients, you have the same recipe. The world-class chef, let's say it's me, is watching you, but I'm not doing any of the cooking, but I'm just watching you. Do you think that you could make that meal? As good as you, probably not. I, I should be able to. You should but... be able to, right? <laughs> I, I should be or able to, to assemble the Legos. Do you think you could assemble yeah, the Legos, right? Yeah. Cooking on, is not my greatest strength, but <laughs> well, there's yeah. a, there's other analogies get, of yeah, following of following yeah, I, I the should, recipe yeah, or process, right? I, I should be able to follow it and yeah. you know to bake the cookies or to do whatever yeah. it is, and and that's how we we view that. Just like people that if they follow a particular process, then they can get the result in any to fix a car, to troubleshoot a computer program, to get six pack abs. You follow, the, but the key is you got to follow the process yeah. and not stop after the second day, right? But it sounds like, and I'm we're obviously at social media marketing world, and I've 
been in several sessions already this morning, and it, it does seem as though it's, from, from an outsider that doesn't understand this, it seems like it's, it's an art as opposed to a science, and, and you know, there's a lot of black magic goes on to, for the people who really make it work. And what you're saying is, no, it's a complete science. If you Absolutely. follow it exactly as you should do, you can get this. And the reason most people haven't done it is they've just not taken the time to understand it. Is, most is it? of the stuff being put out there is intentionally designed to confuse you. Really? By the witch doctors and shamans and voodoo people. Because <laughs> when you go to the hospital, and let's say you want to have LASIK done, for example, are you going to go to the surgeon who's like, I've got some new, brand new, creative, inspirational way to do LASIK. It's never been done, cutting edge. Or the doctor that says, you know, I've done this 7,000 times. It's completely routine. We've never had a mess up, right? It's all very mundane, not an issue at all. Do you want results or do you want to try to shoot for something that's super risky? So absolutely, digital marketing will become like medicine, like medical science, right? It has to be, but there's so many witch doctors with the voodoo doll sticking pins right now that are there. They have an incentive to confuse you because they want you to hire them. Right. So that you, oh, I don't know what to do. I need to hire them. Yeah. No, you need to follow the recipe. You need to learn that there are steps to follow in cooking a meal, in fixing a broken knee, in, in doing whatever. There is a process to follow. Do you think then that because technology and this sort of learning system is moving very, very quickly, you, you have got to spend a certain amount of time understanding where it's going so that you yeah. can keep on top of it. Because I guess, you know, when I started the business, it doesn't seem long ago, but it was, you know, we were doing, you know, we were using a fax. Um, and <laughs> just, you know, we weren't, we didn't have email. Um, we didn't have a website. I think that came many years after. So yeah. even in the short time I've been in my business, it's, you know, you, things have changed quite a lot. Yeah, but it's still distribution, right? A fax machine versus email versus SMS. Yeah, if you when you put it in terms of when you explain it like that in terms of like the UPS, yeah, you know, I, I suppose just having, you know, when you hear the words algorithms and that from people like me, it just sounds yeah. confusing. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, let's speak to an expert. So, okay, I've, I'm, I'm with you. I've got that. So, what do you do? Because your your business is a little bit different. You do teach people who don't know anything about this to do it. So, just just explain a little bit about how you get you know, students and train them, I explain that, because you're not a witch doctor. <laughs> you certainly don't look like Well, one. our stuff has to be repeatable. Okay. And that means we have to take people who have zero experience in the schools that we partner with, mainly in the United States, and teach these kids who have no experience how to be able to use these recipes and be able to drive sales for folks like Escape Fitness. So you have Aaron Rumbaugh, for example, that's working on your account. He started knowing nothing, right? to working on the Golden State Warriors, to working on Escape Fitness. And that's because he's following a process. Granted, he's very smart, right? very intelligent, works very hard, but the key behind all of this is that everything that we do as an agency is governed by a process. And therefore, we don't want to do anything that's not driven by a process because that introduces risk. The reason, like we said before, why McDonald's is the number one hamburger chain is because they have consistency from following an exact process on the fries. Every time I go to another country, I go into a McDonald's and I order the fries and it's delicious and it's always the same, right? Because even though you have someone who's not paying attention because they're worried about their girlfriend or something, when the, the light goes off, beep, 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 you got to take the fries out of the oil at two minutes or whatever, then they can get that consistency. And so we think the same way about scaling out, driving sales and leads for, for real estate agents, for gyms, for fast food restaurants, for all these other folks that we serve because we can follow that formula and because it's repeatable. And the more campaigns that we execute, the tighter our processes become. Therefore, our courses and how we teach are the exact same as the packages that we execute. And those have to be the same. I would argue that what needs to happen in school, a lot of people say, oh, college is you know, no good or it's a scam, you don't need to. No, I don't think that's necessarily true. What's being taught needs to, at the same time, be driven by people that are executing it. So when you go to medical school, you're not just reading books, you're actually working on cadavers. You're actually accompanying another surgeon who's watching you do that. Mm -hmm. So the idea of learning, doing, and teaching occurs in the same cycle. And that's what we've done, is to systematize digital marketing to remove all the smoke and mirrors and voodoo and say, look, if you wanna have custom audiences to do remarketing, here's exactly how you set up your pixel. Here's exactly how you set up these different videos to build no like and trust to drive sales. 
This is how we set up a web page in a certain way. This is how we run a campaign when you're at a trade show and you have an entrepreneur house. This is how we do a podcast. This is how we do everything broken down in individual steps so there's no confusion. Like overall, you can say, oh, well, there's the algorithm and, you know, Facebook's in trouble with the government or whatever it is. Or well, what if they go away? What, if, what do we need about Snapchat and Instagram and, and be so confused? But if you strip that all away, like the number one thing that, that I think would be valuable to you and your listeners is to know everything that you think about marketing is wrong. Because what actually works is what, what works person to person when you meet somebody for dinner, when someone walks into your gym and they, they have questions. You've done that. You already know the answers. Strip away the technology. Strip away all that stuff that you think is true about marketing and focus on what has always driven sales for you. Mm. And when we can take that and capture that on video, transcribe it in the blog posts, distribute that on YouTube and just distribute that on Facebook, distribute that in all these other places, the technology side's already handled. But people get so caught up in the technology. It's funny because yeah. These business owners like you come to us and they have all these technical questions. And I, and I tell them, don't worry about the technology. That's, we handle that. Focus on your story. Focus on the things that you know. Do what you already are doing. Let us distribute that to all your potential customers. The technology has simplified the delivery of messaging. So now we just need to distribute it. Yeah. yeah it makes it sound a lot less daunting when it's like you know, meeting someone for dinner and tell them about you know you hear about them they tell you about you you tell them about your family blah blah yeah. blah and that's your trust your rapport building part that you then use to go on there so i suppose technology allows you to do that in front of thousands of people i yeah. guess nowadays to replicate that conversation to turn you into a minion right, right. to clone yourself a thousand times over yeah. if we were to strip away all the technology and go back to the old, good old days when it was one-on-one -on -one conversations and the shopkeeper remembers your preferences mm. Think about all those conversations that you have, all the things that you say, all the objections that you might have, all the advice that you might have. And we could, do you remember those little things? You could p pull the string and it would be, it would like play a phrase or you yeah. turn it to the cow and it'd make a moo sound, right? The, the, it's the same kind of thing. So all of us, we have maybe 12 things that we say all the time because we have to answer about who we are or yeah. like whatever it is. When it, we just take those items and then we upload them into the system and now they can play forever. Right. So we're able to clone ourselves, we're able to buy back time, and thus we think of these distribution channels as really just like mini Matthews that are doing the work for us. So they can see you, so that when you have the interview with Ed Milet, the algorithm's smart enough to know, oh, this is an Ed Milet fan who also is a gym owner, and here's this interview, you've interviewed Ed Milet, that carries a lot of power. That kind of matching, that's done by the algorithm. You don't have to do that. You know, Netflix and Amazon and Facebook, and th those guys are already doing that matching for you. You don't have to worry about that. And you, and you basically take, you, so you work with schools, train up a lot of these guys and girls to do that, and then you, you, they work with real clients. And they get results by following the recipe instead of having self-doubt. The most difficult people to teach are those that are business owners that think they know how to do marketing. The consultants and the authors even are even harder to teach because they think they know marketing. The hardest part is stripping away all those preconceptions and having them do the things, we just execute the formula. Oh no, I want to be creative, you know. I don't want to be a robot, I don't want to follow the recipe. Well, guess what happens if you've got a recipe for croissants and you, you put in random amounts of sugar and butter at a random temperature for a random, like, you're not going to get the ingredients, right? So where, where do you think things are going now with, and I, I know you've sort of explained a bit about Facebook and not to worry too much about the platforms, but what, what do you think's next to, to come? Or, or do you think we're just still at the beginning of what we've got here and people need to just focus on that first? Which so is remember kind of we, what you're saying, I think. We, yeah. we talked about how search engines were collecting web pages, text on web pages. And the spiders were going out there and scraping all of it, indexing it and ranking it, which are the three steps to running a search engine. And then social media said, well, it's not just web pages. It's people that are posting things and taking pictures of their food and retweeting things and you know, whatever it is. And now that's more information. Same algorithm, more information, greater filter power, right? Because there's, there's just more things. What's the next step? It's going to be things that are in your head that haven't yet made it. Because it's now easier and easier to be able to share what's going on. So imagine that this watch. 
and this phone and that camera and the refrigerator there and the window blinds are now smart. Imagine the thermostat here. Imagine all of these things are listening. You guys, you, you've heard about like IoT, right? The Internet of Things. Okay. The idea that every object is now listening and is connected to the network and is smart and is collecting data, right? Not just like your car is a computer that happens to have wheels. Everything's a computer, right? Well, if every one of these things is collecting information, and now it's easier, where maybe, you know, Apple, the, the sales for the, for the iPhone have gone down for the first time in history, right? And Apple has known that, so they're moving everything into the watch, into the glasses, into the, like, everything, like, where they're going to start to be able to read your thoughts, right? Like Elon Musk with the neural net, or neural, neural lace, right? It's working. It's not, an, it's not fiction. It, they're actually doing it. It's actually working right now, reading right. your thoughts. Yeah. Driving a car, looking at the screen and driving the car just by thinking, spelling words on the screen just by thinking them. That's, that's right now. That's not like some futuristic thing. That's happening right now. That's where everything's going. Because if you want to index the world's information, you need to make it completely frictionless. Don't force people to make websites or post it on social media. Make it so that you have a direct connect to the brain. And that's when things get interesting. And, and what does that mean for business then? Is that... It means computers are going to be interacting with computers. So right now, people in their kitchen, they might have the Alexa and say, hey Alexa, play me a song you know, with Guns N' Roses or something, right? And so she's intentionally dumb. Siri is intentionally dumb. Apple has intentionally made Siri dumb because they don't want you to be scared of the robot that's always listening in your room. What this will mean is that Right now, we're, in a, we're engaging with a computer, but imagine if you're in a self-driving car and you're not having to drive anymore. Now your time is completely open to doing whatever you want to do instead of navigating, and the decisions are being made for you, like your favorite foods and everything else is being made because the food can be delivered by these self-driving robots that are part of whatever right? Uber Eats. Now you have robots that are demand-driven, that are your personal agents, that are engaging with robots on the supply side. So you have robots that are buying from robots, that are engaging with robots. So you're going to see a new wave of tools that are there to help us personally manage our life. So instead of just a virtual assistant in the Philippines, think of all these virtual tools that will read your mail for you, that will recognize your preferences. So it's going to be us building an army of bots that will engage with these other kinds of bots. And think about the software that's necessary to make that happen and the ways that the, you know, you can imagine like bots going back and forth and getting caught in a loop and arguing with each other, right? <laughs> that will happen. So what's, what, what's, what's the future for Dennis then? You know, where do you see yourself? What, what are you lining yourself up for the next 10 years? You know, is it you trying to create this sort of super bot that <laughs> is going to, do everything for you, or what, what, you, know, what, what, what are you, you must be thinking that far the, ahead. The best way to predict the future is to produce it yourself, right? So you can't have fear of technology if you're the one driving it. And we want to live above the API line. We want to drive the things that the bots can't do. So what are, like, almost everything in life can be automated, if you think about it. The, the very last things that can be automated are human relationships yeah. where people are face-to-face -face telling stories and, and building trust. So we want people to be able to build their personal brands and be better personal sellers when it comes to being the, the biggest decisions of your life, like where you're going to live, right? Your, your mortgage is the most expensive purchase usually, unless you're a business owner. Who are you going to marry, right? Or where are you going to spend your time? There are so many sub-decisions related to each of these decisions, and we want to insert marketing vehicles at each of these particular junctures so that people can make money, so that the young adults in our program can learn how to do marketing for the mortgage companies, for the food companies, for the e-commerce companies, and thus we'll always be ahead of the things that are automated. Right. So we're building systems that will drive these other systems. Yeah. And it sounds like it, it kind of comes full circle, so that because everything is going to be automated, even as you say, meeting a partner, you know, the dating side and the algorithms and find, you know, finding the perfect people, which yeah. again, when I was uh, younger, that used to go to nightclubs to do that kind yeah. of stuff and <laughs> didn't always end up in a nice place. But um, it, it seems as though it's coming back to, yeah. you know, the technology stuff. But as what we've said here is, yeah. you know, focusing on that real human emotion and interaction, yeah. you know, whatever the business is, how can that be, be part of it? Because I guess yeah. people 
want that. You know, maybe that's why social media is su successful because people strive to have that human touch and that, you know, yeah. that human relationship as well, isn't it? Which is yeah. why you're saying, you know, create genuine, authentic, show, show people what really goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. You know, what's worked really well for us is sending physical items. Like sending yeah, I got a, your a socks. face. Yeah, yeah, like your, your <laughs> face on a pair of socks. And that's the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a technology person. Because yeah. technology be, oh, this real-time video conferencing, app-driven kind of thing. But it, it, we're, we're coming full circle in yeah. the building relationships. Because it used to be that getting something in the mail was really awesome. And then it became junk mail. Yeah. Now there's just like so many like, you know, junk mail things. And now it, things have become so impersonal. Like when was the last time you got a handwritten letter? Yeah, I, I can't even think. <laughs> and when was the last time you wrote? A letter by hand like a postcard oh greetings i'm in paris i just was thinking of you right when was the last time you've done something like that yeah apart from it, to my children not not very often yeah. so because that almost never happens what if you do that for your customers yeah. what if you do like actually hand, not print out an email not not send them a skype or a text message but will you actually send them something you actually write it by hand you know a lot of the people under 30 can't even write cursive anymore right no but uh, Imagine you actually wrote it out and sent it. Wouldn't that stand out because so, many, so few people actually do it? Yeah. See, it's a reversion back to, people are so inundated and sick of technology, there was, there's a reversion back to the good old days, and that's yeah. what we find is working. That's the irony of the, the fact that there's so much technology. A lot of the, the captains of industry in Silicon Valley, they live in homes that have no technology. Bill Gates doesn't allow his kids to have phones in the bedroom for at meals, right? And what does that say? It means people are craving authentic relationships. Yeah. So instead of emailing a bunch of customers, pick up the phone. If, you're, if there are partners that you care about, take them out for LSD, long, slow dinners, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not microdosing, <laughs> long, slow dinners, right? That, yeah. That's how you build relationships. Tell me the story about Zuckerberg. I, <laughs> <laughs> because I've seen pictures with you and I know you, you know, come on, oh, just, just that okay. one and we can use that as a little. Okay. <laughs> well, so if, you this, know if, this was, if this was liquor, I might give you a slightly different story. But you probably know 10 years ago I made a lot of money on Facebook ads. I was doing $80,000, $90,000 a day. And when there were the apps in the app ecosystem where there are third parties that were doing like car racing games and Farmville and all those silly kinds of games, those guys had to make money off of ads. Right. And Facebook didn't have an ads solution there inside that platform. And back then it was still Facebook flyers. The, the current modern ad system of personalization wasn't there. And a lot of the things that are in Facebook's current personalization system were built off of what we built back there 10 years ago. Then you, so you used to work and for Facebook, did you? Or no, but you we wasn't. were, we built an analytics product okay. for other people that built apps. Oh. And these, these are teenage kids. They'd launch an app and it would go to 5 million users and they want to make money off the advertising. So they would put in a Google Pixel to, to run Google AdSense, right? right? But let's say you had a virtual car racing game and you had a Ferrari and you know, I had a Lamborghini and we're racing against each other. By feeding that data back to Google, Google's reading the keywords, so then they're trying to show ads related to Ferraris and Lamborghinis, and that's not really relevant, no. right? Because what's relevant is who we are. Okay. And so the only way to do that was to use the data that Facebook was giving us through their secret key and show ads based on where you were and what you liked and these kinds of things to personalize. So Facebook yeah. had all of my information in terms of So Facebook of that. gave that to the app developer. Okay. And the app developer passed us their secret key so that we could access all the data on those users and the friends of the users. Every user has 400 friends, so think about how much data we're able to pull and then be able to calculate on the fly what ads we wanted to show to those people. And the app developers didn't know how to do that then, I guess, at no, the time. No, they were just building silly apps. They didn't understand ad serving. So I, I understood ad serving because me and a couple friends from Yahoo, we built a lot of the ad systems there, and we just made a version of it that would work on top of the data that we were able to get from Facebook. Right. So those ads that you saw on Facebook, it could be like who has a crush on you or what's your IQ or okay. someone's looking at your profile. You guys remember some of those yeah. ads? A lot of that was run through our ad server. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I made millions of dollars doing that and Zuckerberg found out about it. Okay? And his head of compliance had a meeting with me and said, you need to shut this thing down because it's, you, know, you guys are scamming people and blah, 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 it's bad. 
So like, he well, didn't, it's he, actually, he wasn't, they weren't in control initially, of that. Then. Yeah, they, and they had, they were not, we technically were in compliance because we weren't violating any of the terms of service. They, they had different advertising guidelines on what was possible if you were a big brand advertiser, if you were a self-service advertiser using flyers, if you were in the app ecosystem, a completely different set of rules. Right? So, and those rules, each of these rules would change all the time. So one time it's okay, and then it's not okay, and then it's, so it's a green, you know, green light, red light, green light, red light, you, you couldn't tell. And we had big players that were playing in the space, you know, like Rock U and the other folks that were eventually bought by like Google and Disney. They were all competing against us to try to serve ads uh. and, and build games and try to take advantage of the fact that Facebook opened up this platform that allowed us to build apps that had the users and the friends of users information. That stopped about four years ago. The Cambridge Analytica things basically shut that whole thing down, right? right? But we were all collecting data. There's no way to police any of this kind of stuff. Facebook technically had a rule called the 24-hour rule where anytime you collected a user's data, you had to get rid of it within 24 hours. Well, how are they gonna know whether we got rid of all this data 24 hours later? They don't, right? <laughs> so everyone just kept the data. And a lot of the data people still have today, right? <laughs> And I told this to Zuckerberg. I've, I met, eventually met him at the Creamery in Palo Alto, which is a hamburger place right there in downtown. This is before they moved to their new place in Menlo Park, which is like a few years ago. This is when they had a cluster of buildings in Palo Alto, and they had this 1501 California, which was their like mini headquarters back then. And he told me that I needed to shut down what we were doing because it wasn't good for the ecosystem, and that he believed that advertising was something that could be seen as not an interruption or an intrusion, but as something that was wanted, like a recommendation from a friend. And I said, you know what? I'm totally with you about how the system can determine what's relevant inside the newsfeed and or inside these different apps. However, we are many years away from that. And what you're saying is idealistic. Meanwhile, you need to have a consistent terms of service. You need to have rules that are the same across all the platforms and don't change. And if you do that, then I'm willing to shut our thing down. Because if we shut our thing down our thing down now, that's like, you know, you kill one drug dealer, all the other drug dealers are gonna come in and fill the void. So it actually penalizes us as the good guys. And is that because but, he knew you then that he mentioned that to you? Yeah. Or were you okay. Well we were the biggest player by far. Oh. We had over fifty percent of all the inventory that was on the app platform then. Wow. Yeah. So because no one else could do anything because the best you could do is Google AdSense, which is terrible. They're, you're making maybe a five or 10 cent CPM. So five or 10 cents for every thousand page views. And we were paying out three or $4. And initially we we're making seven or eight dollars. And I said, oh, this is way too much. We're gonna take half the money or we're gonna take two thirds of the money and we'll pay them $2 because they're only gonna make 10 cents or 20 cents. When we first started testing, we were doing Google AdSense too. And then we started to do affiliate stuff. Like we were running 1-800 flowers. Do you remember that Facebook had gifts so you could pay a dollar to send a gift to people? So we said, you know, you could send, instead of a virtual flower, you could send a real flower, right? So we were making money through FTD on Valentine's Day. What's FTD? It's a big flower thing here okay. in, in the U.S., right? 1-800 flowers. We were doing things with Walmart. I had a call with the folks that ran the affiliate program at Walmart saying, wow, what did you, because they, they said, well, who's, who are these guys that are driving all this traffic from Facebook? We need to have a meeting with them. We got on the phone with them. And they said, what are you doing? And I said, we're just monetizing all this excess app inventory traffic. And they said, well, can you give us more? And I said, well, it's only monetizing at 50 cents and it really needs to be like $2 or $3. And then when we found all that mobile stuff where, you know, who has a crush on you or what's your IQ, that stuff was monetizing seven, eight, ten dollar CPMs, right? And that, those weren't our offers. To be clear, we were just the middle, we were, we were just the network that allowed that kind of advertising to occur. And what were they doing that just to get your, that your email address? So it was a, a double pin confirmed, so it's mobile billing. It's called premium SMS is the euphemism for that. But it's basically charging the phone bills of the kids, or the, the parents' phone bills, right? The, these kids were signing up and they're con pin confirming. And we were doing it in the US, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. We did all of our testing in New Zealand because they were the closest to the United States. And they had, they're very lax on privacy. Like they don't report spam. It's, you know. If it, if it will work in New Zealand and Australia, it will work in the United States and Canada. And right. it will maybe work in the UK, which requires a double opt-in on premium SMS. Yeah. yeah. So Zuckerberg said so that did he, we, did he manage to... So he couldn't shut you down legally then because it was, it was all legal. Well, he right? could shut down anybody he wanted. Right. right. But I knew he wouldn't because he was the only one that could shut down any app developer. And he was so busy doing everything else that I knew he'd never get around to it. But we did come to an agreement. I shut that thing down and the whole ecosystem collapsed 
a couple months later. Then I wrote an article in TechCrunch, which was one of the most popular articles ever on TechCrunch, how to spam Facebook like a pro. And then I got death threats. There are people that were, that were making a ton of money off of our stuff. And they thought that I was the one, like, you know, I ratted them out. Or on my way out, I decided to, like, throw a bomb and kill the rest of them. Because just prior to that meeting with Facebook, I sold copies of our software, of our ad server, so right. that other people could spin up the same software that we have and run their own ad network using our technology. Because I knew, you know what, I'll let these other guys run. And, and some of these guys have exited for over $100 million using our software, right? Because I, I didn't stay in the game. If I stayed in the game longer, maybe would have made a lot more money, right? But I decided, you know what, we're going to get out of this business because I don't believe in. I don't believe this will sustain. I was. I remember just when this thing was like maybe six months prior to that thing of deciding to shut it down. I was with Neil Patel and Harrison Gewirtz, us three. We were at Disneyland in Anaheim, and we were in line at the Pirates of the Caribbean, and it was a zigzag line that went on and on. It's like <laughs> two hours to get to the front. It was hot outside. And it just, I'm a math guy, so I was, I was counting like how many people were in line prior to us and like when we entered the ride. And I calculated, I think like there's 300 something people. And I said, you know, of these 300 children that were in line in front of us at the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, I bet you 30 of them, maybe 40 of them have bought our offer, have signed up for our scam, right? And I thought, well, how many, how many crying conversations do you think that any of those women have had with their parents yeah. when the parents said, hey, what's this charge on the phone bill? How many lives have we caused harm to because of that? And I thought, we need to get out of this game. Yeah. Like, this is, this is not right. I mean, I know, like, we'd lock, I, I would go down, I would, I would have fancy sushi dinner with some friends, and I'd click refresh on the laptop. And I would click refresh at the start, you know, halfway through the meal. And, you know, by the end of the meal, like, we're up another $10,000. We're up another $15,000. And I keep hitting refresh. And even every 30 seconds after hitting refresh, we're up like another $500 in <laughs> revenue. It just didn't seem real. But behind every one of those impressions is a real user. Yeah. Behind every one of those app installs is a real user. Behind every one of those clicks is a real user. That's millions of users that we were impacting. Yet, I'm on the beach clicking refresh on our ads. It's, it's like I was, I was superstitious that if I didn't click, if I didn't keep clicking refresh, that the, the profit wouldn't keep going. So I had to keep clicking refresh on the thing. And at that point, when, we, when I was in line with Neil Patel and I looked at, and Neil was laughing because he thought all this stuff was funny, right? I said, dude, this is, this is wrong. <laughs> like, we need, to, we yeah. need to get out of this game. I know it's making a lot of money and he just laughed. Yeah, so it was, yeah. A, it was a kind of a legal, a legal sort of scam, but... It, it's legal. Yeah. It, was it ethical? No. Right. And you could make the argument that, well, most marketing is deceptive, right? Beer commercials, if you drink this beer, all these pretty women will want to come hang out with you. Like, what marketing is not deceptive, right? I mean, right. to what degree, right? I could have made that argument. Oh, it's not the, you know, guns that kill people, it's people that kill people, yeah. right? And all, all those arguments related to that. But I thought, is this something that I can sustain and be proud of in 10 years from now? Because anytime there's a new opportunity, there's a new industry, the vultures are there first. The parasites are there first until eventually sunlight disinfects. And so I wrote that article in TechCrunch explaining how this will eventually be a mass medium for everybody, for nonprofits, for small businesses, for all these other players. And here we are 10, 11 years later, and now that is starting to come true. And all the things that I told Zuckerberg are now starting to come true. Yeah. And, that, and you see it coming out in the news. So I guess the, the basics and the principles of it are still relevant to all kinds of companies. It's just, yeah. I think, as you said, you know, the, the vultures jump on it first and get in there and Yeah, because we lie in the ad. The, the, the ad, you know, the, the, what, you know what makes a beautiful lie? It's 90% truth. So what do we have on our ad? Because we were able to pull all the information from these other users, we were the first on the internet that I can recall that we're serving an ad that's personalized to Crystal that has her three best friends in it with their names underneath, right? Back then, 10 years ago, think about the technology required to serve an ad with your face and your other friend's face is saying, one of these three friends has challenged you to an IQ quiz, right? To be able to do that. And it'll say like, oh, you know, Dan scored a 107 and he thinks that you're, you know, retarded, right? That you're going to click on that. You're going, you're going to feel challenged because, and so what we're doing is taking advantage of the fact that people are hungry 
for authentic connection to deepen that with their friends. And technology actually makes it harder for people to connect. You have cities like New York that are crowded, yet people are lonely, mm. right? It's kind of that paradox. And the very same thing that made us money, millions of dollars 10 years ago, is the very same thing that we're talking about today. Our entire podcast has been talking about how do you build relationships at scale? It's just like technology is neither good nor bad. Yeah. You can be used to, to kill people and scam people. It can be used to build relationships in a positive way. Fire can be used to blow up a home. It can be used to cook a steak. So final question then, Dennis. Es Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you or other people have believed is impossible and gone ahead and made it possible. What, what would be a recent example of you escaping your own personal limits? A lot of people have told me that our business is impossible. Like financially, economically, it's impossible. The idea of training up young adults where we're paying them doesn't work because the school system is that you're paying thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, right, to go through a, a system that arguably isn't even as good as what we produce. Or people have said you need to raise ten million dollars to be able to execute what you have, and we've proven all these people wrong. With the, it's like a. a a honeybee shouldn't be able to fly, right? According to the physics, yet it yeah. still does. And I see that in, in our system. And just because something appears to be impossible doesn't mean that it can't be. And I think Einstein said that genius is making the complex things or making the, the what is it? Uh, I can't even remember. Basically making, the, making the, the, the really difficult things possible. Right. Right? And simple. Yeah. Or, you know, the idea of, like, instead of shooting for, for the, the eagle and hitting a rock, you know, shoot for the stars and then you hit an eagle, you still win. Right. And what, what, do you, what of you, is that just the philosophy that you've always had to kind of prove the impossible and make it possible? What's, what's driven you to continue to do that? Because, you know, your business is not traditional. You could probably charge way more money by being a you know, typical agency and yeah. selling, you know, some of these secrets that you've developed over the years. What, what, what's kind of, you know, what, what's been your mission to continue to persevere with that? I've always believed in mentorship. And one of my mentors was the CEO of American Airlines. And he opened doors for me. And he gave me education. And everything I have is because other mentors have opened doors for me. It's not because I'm intelligent or I've worked hard or anything like that. It's because other people have literally gone out of their way to make things happen for me. And I thought, how do I make that available on a larger scale? The things that, that I've gotten, how do other people benefit? And how do we create a system of mentorship of people that have done so well that they don't feel like there's not enough and it's, you know, we need to compete because there's, it's, there's scarcity, yeah. right? So Gavin Bell is, is one of the best Facebook marketers on the planet, right? But he doesn't feel like he's got to compete with other Facebook marketers in Scotland. Because there's plenty, there, there's abundance. Right. And I view that because we're still in the, inner, the beginning stages of digital marketing, there's plenty of business. So if we're gym owners, we're not necessarily competing against the other gym owners, even though it feels like we are. Because yeah. if we know what our differentiation is, if we know the stories and why people buy from us versus these other guys, then it's completely different reasons and it's something that competitors can't copy. So when you tell a one minute story about your childhood, that's something no one else can copy. You know, at one point we had Red Bull and Monster and Rockstar as clients. Can you imagine that, right? I talked to our attorney and I said, this, this has got to be wrong. And he said, well, Dennis, when you have two, two companies in the same industry, that's called a conflict of interest. Right. When you have three, it's called a practice. <laughs> and because the reason why, like we had Nike and Adidas, both as clients at the same time for social ads and analytics. And the reason why Nike hired us, which was my childhood dream to have Nike as a client, was because they saw what we did for Adidas for the Olympics and other kinds of visualizations and campaigns that we ran when they're launching different shoes. So Nike was jealous, they both are in Portland. So they invited us over and said, can you do the same thing for us? And then I realized there really is no competition, right? When you're, I don't wanna say it the wrong way, but when you're at the top of your game, you don't need to compete against the other people. We train up all the other folks who are doing Facebook ads out there. They come to us for tech support. Technically, they're competitors, but we don't really see that as being an issue for us because there's, there's plenty enough. And when I went to Red Bull and I said, hey, 
you know we have Monster and Rockstar as clients, right? Or I went to Monster and I said, you know we have Red Bull and the other guys as clients. And they said, oh, it's completely different because Red Bull is competing against Nike and Disney and these other aspirational brands. You know, and Monster is more like, you know, people that are just getting started, they're blue collar, they're, you know, just starting their band up and not about, oh, Red Bull is hoity-toity and rich people. We're completely, the, it's different audiences. Yeah. It's different customers. It's, it's a different marketing message. It's a different why. So the what could be the same. The, it could be yeah. sugar drinks that have caffeine in them. But if you go from why, how, and what, the why is the differentiator. And that's where people connect with you. And then they understand you have expertise and then they want to buy from you. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting way to end because I, I guess the fitness industry, in particular one we service, you know, I, I think in different markets there's between 10 and 20% on average that work out in, you know, that, that go to gyms in these countries. So a lot of people are competing for that same 10 to 20%. And, and, and I guess there's... 80% of people that are not doing anything that probably would relate maybe to that particular gym owner because they've got a similar story and whatever. And I, I guess, you know, if you look at some of the, the fitness celebrities that have come out on social media now and, and have done really, really well, it's probably because they have a really great way of interacting and, yeah. and, and finding a relationship with those people that they decide to follow. And maybe a lot of businesses are probably not as good as some of these, you know, some of these social media influencers that understand how to build relationships um so as, as a i've learned a lot dennis <laughs> and i'm sure there's a lot more i can learn but it's it's certainly simplified things for me so how, how can people find out about you where, where can they go if they linkedin linkedin look for me on linkedin dennis you okay and we'll post um we'll post all your details on uh on, on the show notes so dennis thank you very much i appreciate your time today and uh, best of luck in in the future thank you thanks matthew take care I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.